All right, so yesterday, or not yesterday, Friday, we talked about signal splitting in NMR, specifically with proton NMR. We don't really see signal splitting in carbon-13 NMR, at least not using traditional experiments, and we'll talk about that later. But for right now, we'll focus on splitting for proton NMR. And we said in this example right here, HA, if it has one three-bond neighbor, would be split into a doublet. Underneath that, we said if HA has two three-bond neighbors, gets split into a triplet. And if we have three three-bond neighbors, it gets split into a quartet. And so we said we can use this n plus one rule to predict the signal splitting. And we said it's really important to remember that HA can only be split by neighbors that are either two or three bonds away, not four bonds away, that's simply too far. We said that HA can't be split by other HAs, meaning equivalent protons don't split one another. And we said that HA can't be split by neighbors if you have to go through a non-carbon atom to get there. So that's another important thing to remember. And so we looked at a few examples. I'm a big fan of these tables. In fact, on the quiz and exam, I'll ask you to make a table like this. So make sure you get comfortable predicting what your NMR will look like um, in a tabular form. All right, so now let's talk about this in a bit more detail. We're gonna start talking about coupling constants. So a coupling constant is essentially how wide the splitting is. So it's the distance between the split peaks. And the way we measure this is in hertz. So we're really not going to focus on that too much for right now, but that's the actual unit that we measure coupling constants in is in hertz. So let's take an example specifically from our problem of the day. And in our problem of the day, we had an aldehyde. In fact, I'm going to make it a little bit different. And we can imagine that this aldehyde proton over here, HA, is going to be very different than these protons over here that are HB, right? Because one's coming off an sp2 carbon, the other ones are coming off an sp3 carbon. All right, so now let's imagine HA. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a solid line. I'm going to say, all right, this solid line is going to be my mathematical representation of HA that is unsplit. Okay, so that's basically saying I'm going to ignore my neighboring protons and just imagine, in theory, that this isn't split by my HBs. But we have two HBs that we know in reality are doing splitting, right? So let's imagine one of the HBs. One of the HBs is going to do some splitting. And I'm going to represent it like this. Say, all right, over here, if this happens, how tall do you think our new peak will be if it's split into two equivalent peaks? Half as tall, right? So we can go ahead, go ahead and say, all right, this means that this is going to be half as tall. And so another way of thinking about this is that this is essentially HA split by only one. HB, right? And the way we measure this is we can essentially measure this gap, meaning the distance between these peaks. And typically what we call this is our J value. So we say this is the J value, meaning the magnitude of splitting between these two peaks, specifically the magnitude of splitting between these two protons A and B. So we call this JAB. All right, but we know there's two protons, right? So we can say we can further subdivide these. So over here, let's say, well, what happens if we subdivide this peak? We know that the resulting peak is going to be half as tall as the parent peak, right? So I go ahead and say, all right, we've got this half as tall. And again, we could say this is going to be HA, 
split by the second HB, right? Because we know the second HB will actually split it further. Does this make sense so far? If we think about this, this gap down here between these two peaks is still going to be the same as the gap above it, right? Because it's still splitting between these two same protons. It's still an AB splitting pattern. All right? But we still have the other satellite, right, on the right-hand side we haven't split. So we need to further subdivide that. We're going to say, all right, we're going to subdivide this. And again, it's going to be equal, so I'm going to put one solid line, but then we're actually going to add to that one, right? Because it's going to overlap in intensity. Does that make sense? So if we're splitting and then the splitting is coinciding again after that second split, it's actually going to be additive in that middle chunk right there. So now if we think about this, this is going to be about a peak of one in my grid line. Over here, it's a peak of two, and over here, it's a peak of one. Do you remember on Friday where we talked about the ratio of the size of the peaks? This is actually how it happens, right? It just happens that we have co-alignment of those center peaks, which causes them to be twice as tall in the middle there. So over here, we've got, again, this equal splitting called JAB. All right, so we know that HA, this proton right here, is going to be split into what shape? What's its multiplicity going to be? Is it going to be a singlet, doublet, triplet? It's going to be a triplet, right? It's got two three-bond neighbors. And we said that the triplet down here is going to be in a one to two to one ratio. So let's imagine zooming into this peak really quick. Okay, so if we zoom into this triplet really, really closely on the NMR, we would have something that looks like this. Something that looks like this. And something that looks like this. So this would be a really big zoom in view of that triplet, but you can actually start seeing these mathematical representations in the signal shape itself, which is kind of cool. And what we do in the NMR is we can measure kind of crest to crest up here, and this would be JAB from here to here, and this would be JAB from there to there. Does that make sense? So in reality, when we look at NMR, it's more smooth curves. It's not completely perfect vertical lines like that because we get signal broadening in our NMR. So that's perfectly normal with our experiment. All right, make sense? A little bit confusing. All right, let's take a look at another one though. Let's take a look at this example. Okay, in this example, I've got an ethylene monomer. However, it's functionalized with a fluorine and a chlorine. How many unique protons do we have in this molecule? Two. Why is this proton different than the other proton? Yeah, they're in different environments, right? The proton that I've got right here is essentially trans to a chlorine, or this proton's trans to a fluorine, right? So that makes them unique. So I'm going to go ahead and clearly label these as HA and HB. All right, my question for you is what will HA be split as? Will it be a singlet, a doublet, triplet, quartet? Be a doublet, absolutely. Okay, and then over here we'd say, all right, well, what's HB going to be? It's also going to be a doublet. Meaning that HA is being split by HB, and conversely, HB is being split by HA. Okay, so let's imagine what these peaks might look like in the NMR. Let me clean this up a little bit. So this would be my HA doublet. I'm just kind of representing that as a doublet peak right there. And then over here, we might have our HB doublet. 
All right. The cool thing with this in NMR is you can measure the distance from crest to crest. This is going to be JAB. And the distance from this crest to crest, do you think it's going to be the same or different? Same. It's going to be the same, right? So this is going to be JBA, basically saying B is being split by A. All right? So this is important to know, right? So over here we said it's a doublet. It's going to be split by HB. And over here we said that this is a doublet split by HA. Okay, so in this example, the splitting is occurring at the same intensity, right? If you're splitting one neighbor going one way, it's going to be the same going the opposite way. So let's make a note of that. So another way of thinking about this is in the above example, JAB is going to be the same as JBA. Does that make sense? So if you actually are looking at an NMR and you're trying to determine, all right, this NMR is confusing. I don't even know what I'm looking at. One thing you can do is measure the distance between these peaks. And if the distances are the same, that gives you a clue that, hey, these protons are probably related to one another in that they're neighbors. So you can use that as an additional problem solving tool. It's kind of cool. Do you want to see a weird slash hard example? It's not really a question. I guess it's more so me just asking something rhetorically. Oh. Okay. So let's take a look at this weird or harder example scenario. So I'm going to put a fluorine here, hydrogen here, hydrogen here. So really it's the same molecule, but I've removed one of the chlorines. How many unique sets do we have in this? Three. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and say HA is different than HB, which is going to be different than HC. We agree on that? Okay. So for this one, we're going to focus on HA. All right, if we look at HA, a lot of students will say, well, HA has two different three bond neighbors, shouldn't be split as a triplet? Kind of, kind of not. There's more to the story. It would be considered a triplet if HB and HC were the same protons, but in this case, they're very, very different protons because one is cis to the fluorine and one is trans to the fluorine. So I'll show you what happens in this situation. So let's do the same thing here. So I'm going to draw a solid line, and I'm going to say that this is HA that is unsplit. Make sense? So right now we're just imagining that there's no neighboring splitting going on. All right, we know that it can be split by both HC and HB because they're three bond neighbors. So let's do them one at a time. Okay, so let's do HC first because HC actually is a little bit more powerful when it comes to splitting. Okay, so again, we're gonna split this into equal segments. We're going to say, okay, over here, this is going to be HA split by HC. So what I can do in here is I can kind of draw this and I can measure the distance between these two peaks and I'm just going to call this our coupling constant JAC. Make sense? All right. So we've kind of checked this box off, but we still need to do HB. HB is different than HC, meaning the magnitude of splitting will also be different. So what happens with this is maybe the magnitude of splitting for this one is a lot smaller, meaning less wide. 
So we can split it here and here. And then over here, let's put it there and there. So this would be J, A, B. In fact, let me change the colors just so we are matching everything here. Does that make sense? So over here we'd say that this is now H A split further by H B. Yep. That's a good question. So the question was, how do we know which is going to be wider versus smaller? It's a good question. I'm not going to expect sophomore level organic chemistry students to know that. If you were a master's student in one of my courses, I'd say well, we're going to memorize some tables. Um, but we're going to completely ignore that for this class right now. It gets a little bit more complicated. Um, it depends if it's single bonds or triple bonds, or sorry, single bonds or double bonds, and the angle at which they're offset from one another. We're going to completely ignore all of that for right now. And just say we, we understand that they might split to different magnitudes. So that's important to know. All right. So now let's imagine this, right? This splitting is now all of a sudden kind of funky. Let's do a zoom in view. So rather than getting a triplet, it looks like we're going to get something that looks kind of like this. And then over here, we're going to get something that looks kind of like that. That's not the greatest drawing. Let me fix that. All right, so this clearly isn't a triplet. Does anybody know what this might be called? It's called a doublet of doublets. <laughs> Oftentimes this is just abbreviated as DD. Sometimes you get doublets of triplets, sometimes you get doublets of quartets, sometimes you get triplets of doublets. It really just depends on the unique situation that we're looking at. But it is something that I want you to be aware of, and I want to make a note here. If neighboring protons are different, then you may get unique splitting. So in this case, we're getting kind of unique splitting where we've got doublets of doublets. All right, this gets tricky though. What happens if we have three or four different types of unique three bond neighbors? And we've got this super complicated splitting pattern that's really hard to decipher, really hard to interpret. Does anybody know what chemists call that? I'll give you a hint. Let's go back to our NMR study guide. Some of you may have noticed at the bottom, this funky shape. Oftentimes when you run into this super complicated splitting pattern that's just way too hard to interpret, we just call it a multiplet and we say, nah, we don't really know what's going on here. It's just the multiplet blob, meaning it's really, really unclear what's going on here. And if you have a high level spectrometer, sometimes you can deconvolute it. But I will say with most um, university level, at least undergraduate level NMRs, you really can't pick apart what's going on in a multiplet, so we just call it a multiplet. So we're just going to kind of leave it at that. Does that make sense? It is kind of a nice cop-out, too, and you can't figure out what's going on. You're like, yeah, just call it a multiplet. That's good enough. All right. <laughs> Anyways, let's kind of move on a little bit. So we've talked about splitting. We've talked about measuring the distance between the peaks that are split. That's all really useful information. Yeah. And the 
in the right setting and the real intention is wider and is bigger than the right. Yeah, so that's a good question. So, so why is the delay system? So if we imagine looking at this, really JAC is going to be the middle of these two peaks measured apart from one another. So this would be JAC. And that is much, much wider than this peak right here and here, which is JAB, meaning they're being split at different magnitudes. Does that make sense? Yeah, so I, I think you would say, I don't know, like, why is the ground be smaller? But is it going to be, I don't know, which one is the C, which one? Yeah, so that's a good question. So JAB is always going to be, at least in this representation, between the two smaller satellites, meaning after that initial split, it could split further. Yeah, good questions. All right. So I have an unanswered question. Yeah. For J, is the magnitude on the Union Wheel, is mm -hmm. that in the valley or it's on the other side or inner side? Yeah, that's a good question. So when you're measuring coupling constants, where are you measuring from and to? In this case, let's zoom in really quick. So J, A, B, what we're going to be measuring at is the distance from the top of this peak to the distance to the top of that peak. How about JAC? So JAC is a little bit different. So with JAC, essentially what we're doing is we're measuring the middle point between these. Yeah, so in that case, you'd be measuring valley to valley. Yeah. In fact, most modern NMR programs will automatically do all of this for you, which is really nice. Um, back in the day, meaning the 90s, um, you had to do this kind of on your own, but most modern NMR software will actually do a lot of this for you, which is pretty slick. All right, so the one thing we haven't really talked about is we know the integration, meaning how tall a peak is or the area underneath it. We've talked about signal splitting to a fairly high degree now, but we haven't talked about where the peaks show up, meaning left to right. And that's called chemical shift. So let's talk about chemical shift and where peaks show up. All right, so you can actually calculate the chemical shift value, meaning how far left or right on the spectrum your peak will show up, and we use this delta symbol. What we say is it's the observed shift, meaning gap from TMS in hertz, times 10 to the 6, so basically megahertz, divided by the operating frequency, of the NMR in hertz. So on the denominator side, we've got this operating frequency of your NMR in hertz. This is instrument dependent, meaning some NMRs run at 60 megahertz, some run at 300 megahertz, some run at 400 megahertz, some run at 1,000 megahertz. Um, it really just depends on the strength of your NMR. Um, the one that we'll be using up in lab is a 60 megahertz NMR, so just a little bitty baby one. Um, but if you go on to a, a larger university, they'll likely have 300, 400, 500, or even larger um, NMRs. But that's basically what we're plugging into the bottom. All right, so on the top, it says observe shift. What? Somebody say something. Okay, so the top part said observe shift from TMS. So the, then the question is, well, what the heck is TMS? It is tetramethyl silane, basically meaning you've got a silicon atom with three methyl groups coming off of it. How many unique signals are there for TMS, tetramethyl silane? One, which means it's a really good internal standard, and basically what it means is that all NMRs set these protons to occur at zero. 
So that's kind of our internal standard, meaning how far away are our peaks from that internal standard. All right, then the other thing too is what units are we really looking at here? Does anybody remember the units that we're looking at with NMR? It's not unitless, it's kind of weird. It's called part per million. However, most people never refer to it as part per million, they just abbreviated it as PPM. So we're dealing with PPM scale. So tetramethylsilane is always set to be at zero PPM on the NMR scale. Don't ask me why, but they used to measure this in a different unit called tau, and before that they used to just measure it in hertz. It's gradually evolved. NMR is actually a fairly new technique in the history of chemistry. It wasn't really used very widely until about the 1960s, 1970s. Um, so people have been slowly trying to unify the units that have been used internationally. So now today, um, uh, PPM is the universally recognized scale for NMR. All right, so now let's imagine this NMR scale. If you remember, I said that the scale is a horizontal scale and the larger numbers are on the left, so 15 would be over here, zero would be here, and then PPM, part per million, would be the scale in between those. So we could even break this up further, and we can zoom into various regions on this NMR to explore it more deeply, right? So what this means is that TMS is defined as being at zero PPM, and the majority of the peaks that we'll observe, at least in sophomore level organic chemistry, will be kind of in this zero to 15 ppm range, give or take. Some books will say zero to 12, zero to 13. I just say zero to 15 because it's a nice round number. All right, so then the question is, why might a peak show up here or down here or in the middle? We've got to kind of determine what's going on there. And there's two main factors that affect shift. All right, so let's kind of look into these two factors a bit more. So the first one is electronegativity or induction. All right, so let's try to, again, redraw the scale down here. I'm going to say, all right, over here we've got 15, got 10, got 5, We've got zero. Typically what that means is if your proton is near an electronegative atom, it's more likely to show up closer to 4 ppm. Typically, the further away we get from an electronegative atom, the closer we get to zero. So that's a pretty useful tool. We can start looking at relative electronegativity trends by doing that. All right, so that's one general trend that we see. The second general trend we see is aromaticity. This has a fancy name. It's the anisotropic effect. And I'll kind of show you what's going on here. We're not going to get too far into the physics behind it. But again, I'm going to redraw the scale. I'm going to say, all right, we've got 15, got 10, got 5, got 0. This is in the PPM unit. Typically, what we're looking at is aromatic protons show up in the 6 to 9 ppm region. And I'm just going to put usually, because there's always exceptions in chemistry. So then the question is, well, let's imagine an aromatic system, like benzene. 
right? If we think about these protons coming off of benzene, they're all equivalent to one another, right? They're all in the exact same chemical environment. Are they very polar, those protons? No, they're not near electronegative atoms. So why the heck are they showing up in that 6 to 9 ppm range if they're not near any polar atoms? Not quite. Something even weirder. So let's take a view of what's going on here. So I'm going to imagine us looking at benzene kind of side-on view, like this. If we think about the carbon atoms in benzene, they're all sp2 hybridized, meaning they all have vacant p orbitals. Or not vacant, they all have p orbitals participating in pi bonding. And we can draw out all of these hydrogen atoms like this. Does that make sense? And we know that there's resonance going around that ring system, right? So we could say, okay, we know that the pi bonds are actually going to be delocalized around the top and the bottom here. So essentially you've got these p orbitals aligned so that the electrons are completely delocalized around the ring system. So what effect does that have? Well, basically we've got charge moving around in a circle making its own mini magnetic field. A magnetic field that interacts with the magnetic field in our NMR and throws off the chemical shift. So it's really weird to think about this, but when you do this, you're making a magnetic field that's actually going through the environment where these protons reside. And that throws off their chemical shift into the 6 to 9 ppm range. If you want to get into really advanced chemistry, once in a while you get wacky signals that are at like negative 5. We're not going to get into why that's the case, but again, that's due to these weird mini magnetic fields created by um, aromaticity or resonance, if we want to simplify it that far. Does that make sense? All right. So I know this is a little bit tricky. I'll show you the other thing, too. NMR study guide. I gave you this handout the other day. And on this handout in the front, I want to zoom in here. We just talked about how these aromatic protons show up in this range. And we just said over here that typically protons like this that are attached to an electronegative atom typically show up between 2 and 4. And then we said that things that are typically attached to nonpolar atoms typically show up kind of between 2 and 0-ish. But we also missed a bunch of these boxes. Good news is I will give you this cheat sheet on exams. So then you'll have to start using these other clues. So for example, if I were predicting where an aldehyde proton would be, well, I'd say, ah, an aldehyde would be between 9 and 10 ppm. If I were looking at where a carboxylic acid proton would be, I'd say, well, a carboxylic acid proton would be between 10 and 12. So you can use this as approximate ranges. You can even go further and you can say, well, what about alkene protons? Well, they normally show up between 4 and 6. Why do you think they show up differently than aromatic protons? Because aromatic carbon-carbon bonds aren't true double bonds, right? These are true double bonds, and they also don't have any ring current associated with them. So you can start using this as a rough guide for predicting where various protons might show up in NMR, which is pretty useful. Does that make sense? Good thing is, we've got the exact same thing down here for carbon-13 NMR, so we can start predicting where carbon signals will show up well. Just make sure that you go through this carefully and that you try to predict reasonable numbers and then use this reasonably. You might notice that there's some pretty wide ranges for some of these, so we're just going to have to make solid guesses when we're working on these. All right, so kind of continuing along with the idea of carbon NMR, we need to finish up by talking about it. There's good and bad news with carbon NMR. Let's start with the bad news. Bad news, it is way less sensitive so much so that we're actually not going to do it in lab because to get a good NMR spectrum on our spectrometer that we have, it would take overnight to run your sample. And I'm not going to be here for two months running all of your samples every night. Does anybody remember why it's less sensitive? Lump 
Yeah, we can only look at carbon-13. That's the carbon with an odd mass number, and it's only 1.1% abundant. Why can't we look at carbon-12? Why don't we just look at the isotope that's like 99% abundant? Has an even mass number. NMR only works for nuclei that have an odd mass number, so it doesn't work here. All right, second thing is usually no splitting. Which is kind of nice. There are certain carbon NMR experiments where you can actually see splitting and it will be split by the number of protons immediately attached to that carbon. When we go back and we do ACS review, I'll kind of show you some tips and tricks for how to handle that. It's not super common though in our textbook. Second thing is there are usually no integrations. Because it's less sensitive, it's a lot harder to get accurate integration values, so we just normally don't do that. So the question is, well, what does this tell us then? It tells us a couple of things. It tells you the unique number of carbons. And then the second thing is that the chemical shifts of these peaks can be correlated to functional groups. So just like I showed you that chemical shift cheat sheet, if you see a carbon-13 peak showing up around 200 ppm, you could say, well, that's probably a carbon associated with a carboxylic acid. So you can start making assumptions like that. So these are the key things. I will say that there's a ton of experiments you can do, some of which are talked about in the textbook. So there's um, experiments where peaks go up and down. We're really not going to get into that in this class just simply because we don't have very much time. But if you'd like to read about it in your textbook, he has a whole section talking about some of these kind of different experiments. Does that make sense? All right. So let's go back really quick. And I just wanted to reiterate this NMR study guide. So this NMR study guide will be given to you on exams, which is incredibly helpful. You still need to know what you're doing. Just like with IR, having the study guide in and of itself won't save you. This page I normally don't give on the exam because it's really easy to predict, but try to remember that n plus one rule for picking peaks. Remember what a multiplet means? Multiplet means it's just really hard to interpret. All right, last thing I wanted to talk about is what do we do in situations like this? So I've got two different constitutional isomers below, both esters. All right, so how many signals would we expect for this? Three. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and draw in all of my protons. Say, all right, red protons, green protons, blue protons. And then I'll do the same thing over here. The colors aren't correlated. In fact, let me use different colors. just do black for this one. All right, so let's go over to this red set. What will this be split as? Singlet. What will it integrate as? Well, integrate as three, right? It's made up of three protons, so I'd write singlet 3H. All right, over here. What will this one be split as? The green set. How many three bond neighbors? Three. So it'd be a quartet. And I'd say, well, it's made up of two protons, so it'd be 2H. All right, what about this one over here? Be a triplet? It'd be 3H. Okay, let's do the same thing over here. What would this one be? Triplet. Triplet. 
B3H. Okay, over here for your quartet. 2H and over here singlet and B3H. So looking at the integrations and splitting, can we tell these apart? No, right? We would expect the same integrations to occur with the same splitting for either molecule, but they are very different molecules, right? So in the Klein textbook, what he gives you is these guides. So let's try to focus in on this one right here. So what I would first do is I'd go to this guide and I'd say, ah, this has a benchmark value of 0 0.9. And then I'd say, all right, what I need to do is I need to say, well, this group of protons is attached to a CO double bond, meaning a carbonyl group. So then I would go over here and I'd say, all right, it's attached to a carbonyl group, which means I need to add one to that benchmark value. So this would show up at 1.9 ppm. Does that make sense? We can use that as benchmark value. Let's go over to the singlet on the other side. So the singlet on the other molecule we said was 3H. Again, I could go ahead and I could say, well, it's still a methyl group, so it's still going to be 0 0.9. And then I would say, well, this time it's attached directly to an oxygen, right? What sort of oxygen? Of an ester, right? So then I would go over here and I'd say it's attached to the oxygen of an ester, so I need to add 3 to it. So now I can go ahead and say this should show up at 3.9 ppm. So now we can start using chemical shift as a way of actually differentiating which of these two potential compounds we have in solution, which is pretty cool. We can do it with the other ones as well. So for example, we could compare the green to the purple using this exact same strategy. The good news, I will give this to you on exams. I won't explain how to use it, but I'll give it to you. So it would be beneficial to practice it. Make sure that you can use this as an additional tool for differentiating um, things like uh, constitutional isomers of esters. Yep. Yeah, so third term, I won't give you any of the cheat sheets, but you'll kind of learn the trends. Um, the ACS exam is much easier though in terms of its NMR stuff, so you won't need to memorize stuff like this for the ACS. Yep, all right. I'll see some of you in lab and we'll continue doing NMR practice.